Hello, and let's talk about the latest India Bangladesh match, and this time it's not in cricket but in the economy. The latest news comes out of IMF numbers, which showed that in terms of per capita income, Bangladesh may be doing better than India. Now, per capita income is the country's GDP divided by its population, and according to the IMF, that number for Bangladesh is dollars one thousand eight hundred eighty-eight, while for India it will be dollars one thousand eight hundred seventy-six. Now, these numbers led to a huge debate with the opposition piling on the government. And the latter saying that it was not a fair comparison and bringing up its own numbers to support its claim. The question here, however, is not whether it's a fair comparison or not, although it is useful to understand these numbers. The larger question is about how bad a state our economy is in, and fact after fact, report after report proves that you can quibble over the details, you can shift the goalposts, question the sincerity of the sources, but there's too much information flowing in from everywhere. To term it some kind of conspiracy anymore. Clearly, we are in deep trouble as far as the economy is concerned. To understand some of the numbers around the Bangladesh controversy and the larger issues within the Indian economy, we spoke to senior journalist Anandya Chakravarti. This is what he had to say. Anandya, thank you so much for joining us. So uh, we have been getting a lot of bad news over the past few weeks, the past few months on the economy, unemployment, uh, the industry, all these, and we talked about this. And now this week's latest news has been with regarding India falling behind Bangladesh. Now yes. there is a bit of <clears throat> sorry, there's a bit of condescension around such comparisons often, but nonetheless, it's important to consider the fact that India is, of course, a massive country, a young population, a very diverse economy. Bangladesh is, of course, a much smaller country, and so when we look at these two countries being more or less placed on the same level, there is a question about what maybe the Indian government is doing wrong. So we'll come to that. But first of all, could you talk about the metrics under which these comparisons happen and maybe explain it to our viewers also? Yeah, you know, before that, I just want to ask you a question. And I know that you are an expert on, you know, international affairs. So maybe your view is different from most other people. But think of the average Indian. What do, what do they think when they think of a Bangladesh, right? Right. So uh, I would say that, I mean, for considering especially the past uh, year or so, maybe the kind of talk about Bangladeshis that has come up is largely to do with them being some kind of people who were sneakily entering into the country and uh, taking over land. This has really become a very commonplace narrative among a lot of people in our families, in our WhatsApp groups, in everyday discussions. So that kind of a narrative is definitely being set among a lot of people as far as I can see. And also an issue of national security, that they're a threat. Exactly, uh, exactly. But at the same time, that even those who have a certain empathy, they, we all, whether it's a person who sees the Bangladeshi as a threat or someone who sees the Bangladeshi as, uh, uh, as a fellow citizen of the world, right? we all think that Bangladeshis are utterly poor, that they're starving. And they come here because they have no money, they, uh, the poorest country. Even internationally, I mean, you could correct me if I'm wrong. I think when, whenever one talks about the West talks of the poor, they either talk about sub-Saharan Africa or they talk of Bangladesh. Right. They're the deserving of our charity. Mm -hmm. Now, so obviously when uh, IMF says that Bangladesh's per capita income in 2020 is going to be $1,888 and India's is going to be $1,877, it really shocks us. We think, Oh my goodness, does that mean that we are poorer than Bangladesh? And a lot of middle class people, you know, they don't really care about things except as to what foreigners will think. Right. They'll say that this will be terrible. People are going to, the West is going to laugh at us. Mm -hmm. When we go on our holidays, people are going to say you're poorer than Bangladesh. Right. So that really uh, affects them badly. So in this context, of course, we used uh, per capita GDP as the metric to sort of measure uh, this comparison. But obviously, across the world, there's often a lot of question about whether that's really a good metric, whether it's whether it really reflects nature, the nature of how society works. And I think certain government sources have been raising the same argument to kind of say that it's uh, a temporary thing. Of course, now these same government sources are definitely happy to use GDP when it comes to other calculations. But I'll leave, I'll leave that aside. But nonetheless, uh, there has been a lot of pushback on this by saying that this is just a temporary phenomenon. So could you maybe take us through some of the arguments which the pro-government sources are also making? Well, you know, the, what the uh, sources are saying, because, you know, these are always never 
directly announced by the government, but they think right. that sources tell the media, uh, is valid, which is that even though it is still within the per capita GDP metrics, as you said, and which is questionable, but it is still valid because essentially the government is saying, look at real GDP. When you compare in dollars, that dollar comparison is actually just a nominal GDP in rupee terms. It does not, in uh, current uh, um, income terms, and it does not take into account uh, inflation. Bangladesh has had a higher inflation rate than us. So therefore, in real terms, uh, it's not the same. So the IMF itself gives us data. If you go to the report and download it, uh, our viewers can do that. You'll find that they give us data in terms of PPP dollars. Now, PPP dollars or purchasing power parity dollars is essentially uh, something. To, to, essentially, if $1 can buy you, let's say, a burger and a Coke in the US, right? How much would it that bur that same burger and Coke cost in India? And how much will it cost in Bangladesh? Now, in India, that same amount same thing that a dollar can buy in America would cost you 22 rupees. The same thing would cost 33 Bangladeshi taka in Bangladesh. Now, obviously, Prashant, we know that uh, there's a difference between going to a bank and you want to go to travel abroad or you want to import something, you'll have to buy real dollars, right? Not PPP dollars. In India, you'll have to pay about 75 rupees to buy a dollar. In Bangladesh, you'll have to pay 85 Bangladeshi taka to buy a dollar. But when we compare lifestyles, living standards, we have to look at what basket of goods and commodities can be bought with local currency. If you compare the same basket of goods and commodities, then in India, it is 22 rupees to a dollar. In Bangladesh, it's 33 rupees uh, taka to a dollar. Now, that is the comparison that we have to look at. GDP per capita GDP, in PPP dollar term. And when we come to that, then we see that uh, in India, uh, in 2020, the PPP dollar terms, in PPP dollar terms, our uh, per capita income will be something about $6,284, and Bangladesh's will be $5,139, which is about 20, 22% lower than what we have even after the COVID impact. So therefore, in real terms, it is true that what the government is saying is correct when it comes to just per capita GDP. But there are definitely, there, there are some other numbers to this picture also, which again get mi missed out. So for instance, if you look at say, what is the kind of average wealth that we're talking about? Or even for that matter, growth, I think is something you talked about also as a metric. Which yeah. is so could you talk a bit about that? Also? So let's just, let's, let's take the same argument that the government is using. PPP GDP per capita GDP, right? PPP average income in Bangladesh and India. And we use that same thing to look at growth. Right? And we take the Modi period for the first five years, which is 1450 to 1920. We're going to take that because we are removing this year, the COVID period. Mm -hmm. We know because COVID has affected India much more than most other countries. So let's give the government that and take a comparison there. And then we'll see that the average, uh, that the growth between 2014 to 2019 in Bangladesh's uh, per capita income in real terms, in PPP dollars, has been almost 50%. It's 49%, right? So, uh, but in India, it's just 33%. So an average Indian's income in real terms went up by one third, an average Bangladeshi's income went up by 50%. Ha! So here we're clearly seeing a difference in growth rate. And the thing actually becomes worse when we look at the future. Bangla, uh, when we look at what... Uh, is being project, projected for 2020, right? When we include the COVID year. Again, let's took a five-year cycle. Then, despite the COVID collapse, Bangladesh's uh, income in PPP terms and average income goes up by 38%. And in India, it's just 15%. Right. So that's the growth part. The, uh, and of course, you've also raised issues about, um, uh, if you could just uh, tell me again exactly what you wanted to know about the numbers related to wealth distribution, I'd Absolutely. probably be able to give a... Yeah, yeah. so, so yeah. the key question, of course, one of the issues that you often talk about in India's context is the inequality involved. Yes, so there's, there's There is a considerable amount of wealth generation that has happened over the past two decades, especially, but how much of this is kind of being 
enjoyed by everyone or being equitably distributed versus. So we have seen numbers about how, for instance, Ambani and Adani's fortunes Absolutely. have really increased since the lockdown, for, as an example. And this is something that's generally part of the pattern. So when we look at this aspect, for instance, how do the two countries compare? So let's look at two things. One is that Bangladesh is not an ideal place. By the way, Bangladesh has great growth since 2013. If you look at the Bangladeshi uh, own economists own assessment and Bangladeshi media, if you look at it, they are also complaining about growing inequality. Mm -hmm. So it seems that Bangladesh's grow or export oriented growth pattern right, right. It might have increased improved its uh, per capita or average right. income, right. but it has increased inequality. It has increased unemployment and it has definitely made employment uh, levels lower and more difficult, especially in urban areas. So let us put that as a caveat here. And we know pictures, you remember when that, uh, that factory collapsed, there was right. that, uh, uh, these terrible photographs of the conditions of Bangladeshi workers. Garment How, workers. It's, uh, garment workers. And so there, you know, someone is going to get up and say, oh, we must follow, follow the Bangladeshi uh, method, but that is also not an ideal thing all right so now but let's look at uh, something like uh, uh, what an average per capita income can always be skewed by very rich people right, right? so if let's say a few people earn a lot and uh, uh, let's say that uh, the total income is of a country is one lakh right and there are a thousand people then the per capita income will be 100 rupees right but it is possible that two people out of that one lakh actually earned 80,000, right? And the remaining 98 earned the remaining uh, 20,000 mm -hmm. rupees. So we know that the average of that remaining 98 is actually very, very low, right? It is no longer that uh, 1,000 rupees. It's actually somewhere closer to 200 rupees, right? right? So here's the thing uh, that is uh, worth looking at as to the average per capita gives us a particular sense of the average, but there's also something that is usually uh, worth looking at, which is the median income. Okay. Median income means exactly at the midpoint. 50% are below us, 50% are above us. This is difficult data to get. So I'm going to use the Credit Suisse wealth reports to give a sense of it using wealth data, right? Uh, now, wealth data tells us uh, a sense that, it gives us a sense that what has been the past income of people? How much could they save and convert into various forms of wealth? Right. Right? Whether it is financial, whether it is property, whatever, right? So it is an indicator of past wealth uh, income as well. If we look at uh, Credit Suisse's 2019 report, <coughs> Prashant, that in India, the average wealth in US dollar terms, average wealth per adult in US dollar terms is about $14,600. Right, approximately, right, and in Bangladesh it is just six thousand six hundred dollars. In India, the av the median wealth, which is fifty percent of people are below that wealth level, is three thousand dollars. In Bangladesh, it is two thousand eight hundred dollars. So now, if I take the ratio between the average and the median, average can be pushed up by very rich people, and therefore we take the median, which is it gives us an idea about where the middle income people are exactly. clustered, right? Right, right? There we see that in India, the ratio is 4.8 times. In Bangladesh, it is 2.4 times, right? The higher the ratio, obviously it tells us that very rich people are pushing up the average, average. Right? Right. right? The lower the ratio, it tells us that there is a higher clustering around that midpoint, mm -hmm. right? These are obviously there can be various other exceptions to this rule, but I'm just saying this is a this is a still a, a you know rule of the thumb indicator that we can use. It is clear then that more people in Bangladesh are clustered around their average wealth than in India. And if we take that same thing, extend that for incomes, then we can say that per capita income in Bangladesh is more representative right. than per capita income in India which suggests that a larger proportion of Indians are worse off than a larger proportion of Bangladeshis, Absolutely. right? So right. that itself is something that should, we should be worried about and perhaps even ashamed of. I mean, I'm saying we should be ashamed of because we had such a huge uh, gap, a start, starting lead compared to Bangladesh. 
Absolutely. Right. And finally, to sort of uh, bring in maybe something more of a political question. Yeah. Uh, of course, if this is an issue we have sort of uh, looked at in the past as well. And I think like we discussed in the beginning, the comparison with Bangladesh is instructive, but it's probably not the best comparison in its own sense. Absolutely. Well. Right. So as far as the Indian setup is concerned, especially over the past four to five years, what do you think are maybe, say, off the top of your head, two or three factors where we just completely went wrong or completely went off the rails? I think two very clear, demonetization and GST. Okay. Demonetization essentially removed money from the hands of a large section of people. Right. It had an immediate demand impact, right? Mm -hmm. But I would still say that there is a significant number of people in India who had never probably seen a 500 or a 1,000 rupee note in 2016 November. So they were not affected, right? But those who buy things, we should also remember that those people don't buy anything. Right. Yeah. That is the state of India's economy. And for that, you cannot blame the Modi government. You have to blame the entire system since 1985 onwards, since when we've seen the higher level of inequality and lower level of employment growth. But GST, to my mind, is an even bigger factor. It is even a worse situation because what it did essentially is that it killed the unorganized sector. Right. Because we know that Prashant, that uh, the, the lower uh, income people or even small businesses, the only reason they had an advantage was because they didn't pay the full tax, right? So a small manufacturer of a, a mattress, right, which you and I use, maybe a small workshop makes a mattress and sells it to you in a small shop, did not pay full tax and therefore you got it for cheap and you bought it. They had that business. As soon as they have to pay GST or have to supply to another vendor with a registered GST number, because otherwise that vendor is not going to take your thing because they'll not get input credit, they are going to be moved out of the market. So we are essentially seeing a consolidation of organized large companies, larger companies eating into the space. And this is, I think, the biggest reason why CMI's data, which tells us what how uh, how first demonetization and then GST ate into India's employment. So I would say that these are the two things. And the third point, I think politically, there is fisc fiscal fundamentalism that this government has been following, which, uh, by the way, is even worse because it has a populist agenda where it does provide certain kinds of, uh, certain aid to the poorest of the poor. I would say that the poorest of the poor, which I've argued many times, are probably better off today. The bottom 20 to 30 percent are better off, marginally better off today than they were under UPA. And this is not something to be greatly proud of because essentially they're still being kept at subsistence level where their nose is just above water. Right? They were sinking underwater and therefore so many of them voted against the UPA and kicked it out of power right? in 2014. But... What that does is when you're diverting money to run these schemes for electoral gains, essentially you're not spending on anything else. So there's no spending on anything else to make for productive growth. And that is what we're seeing right now. So the section immediately above them has been the worst. Hit. Yeah, the section, the squeeze is right there. But uh, COVID-19 squeeze has also, there's, you know, once that squeeze takes place, because that section is also a buying section. The poorest of the poor buy nothing. Whatever this government might say, whatever anyone might say, at best, they'll buy some biscuits or maybe when they're slightly better off, they'll go and buy some hair oil. But I, you know, all the uh, anecdotal uh, ethnography in terms of journalistic reports will tell you they buy nothing, right? Uh, so the squeeze is essentially those who are, who are in danger of always falling below poverty line. And also those who are just above that. They're also very badly off. But sometimes they'll buy a phone, they'll go and buy hair oil, they'll buy a sachet shampoo, they'll buy some biscuits, they'll buy batteries. You know, these things happen. Right. They might save and buy a cycle. So that is why that collapse is taking place. But when they stop buying, the companies which sell to them, they lose out. They are unable to earn as much as they do. And then they start sacking their managers. They start right. taking making pay cuts, they stop advertising when they stop advertising, the media doesn't get money, journalists are sacked. So it's a vicious cycle. So we are seeing that squeeze taking place where 
the top 1% is now going down, is now, which used to be the richest, is now becoming 0.5%, soon 0.2%, and then it will might be led to two, right? Adanya Namban, <laughs> that is what will... So that is, that is essentially the problem that India is facing today. Right. A massive, massive demand crisis. Absolutely. Right. Thank you so much, Arindya, for talking to us. Thanks a lot, Prashant. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back on Monday with more news from the country and the world. Until then, keep watching News Click.